Hello, colleagues. Good morning once again. Uh, we are we are ready to start uh, was today's session. This is uh, the fourth day and the last day of uh, our our training, which has been very uh, interactive uh, sessions, and I hope it, it will be the same today and even much more interesting today with the special topics we will be discussing. Uh, I would like just to let you know that today's session will be facilitated by Mary Wanyonyi from the African Development Bank. Uh, Mary Wanyonyi is uh, uh, responsible for uh, strengthening statistics, uh, uh, national statistical systems, and also uh, including the NSDS, but I will let her introduce herself properly. Uh, Mary, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As you've heard, my name is Mary Wanyoni with the African Development Bank. I work with the Anglophone countries, dealing with the national strategies for the development of statistics and regional strategies for the development of statistics, as Philip has indicated. And uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Yeah, today is our last day, and you'll agree that actually we've had some quite good interactive sessions. And uh, we do thank already Paris 21 and South Africa for organizing such a very good regional training course. So today we are supposed to be tackling the last activities that are planned for us in the training agenda. And uh, we'll be having some key topics that are key to the NSDS process, including gender statistics. We'll have a, a presentation on mainstreaming of gender statistics by Lorraine of Paris 21. We hope to have a country presentation from Lesotho. It will be good to know who is presenting, whether it is Selena or uh, somebody else. Then we'll have a, a presentation from Philippe on fragility, crisis, and statistical strategic planning. And we'll also have a country presentation, which should be confirmed, maybe like Libya. We'll have some interaction there. And at the end of the session that I'm facilitating, we'll also be able to undertake an evaluation that is good to share our experience and give critical input in improving future training workshops. So without uh, taking much of your time, I would request Lorraine, if you are ready, to share with us your presentation on mainstreaming gender statistics. Thank you. Welcome, Lorraine. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I'm really, really glad to join you all today um, to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, gender statistics. I'm really, I'm hopeful that this will be a useful way to actually apply some of the knowledge that you've already learned and some of the other sections we're gonna talk about some of the tools you've already learned about and a lot of the concepts and themes um, because gender is a cross-cutting issue as we'll see in just a moment. So let me see if I can load up my presentation here. Actually, uh, can you guys see it? <laughs> yes, you can see it, Lauren. Okay, good. Um, my computer's been a bit slow this morning, so we'll see if we can get it to cooperate now. Ah, good. All right. Let me move this here. 
Okay, so the as Mary mentioned, so we're going to talk about mainstreaming gender statistics in the NSDS process. And just as kind of a really quick introduction, um, I'm Lauren. I lead the data ecosystems team at Paris 21, which uh, includes, um, among other things, our work on gender statistics, along with issues around participation and governance. Um, and data use. So um, really glad to join you all. Um, this work really started um, in cooperation with UN Women under the framework of the Making Every Woman and Girl Count program. And I just really want to um, kind of recognize them up front because without them, this really wouldn't have been possible to develop. So um, just to go through a quick outline of what we're going to discuss today. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of what gender statistics are. Um, and just so that we can all be talking from the same starting point. And then we'll talk a little bit about why mainstreaming gender statistics is important. Um, there are probably some obvious things that you can think of off the top of your heads. There are probably some things you maybe haven't thought about before. So um, we'll go through that. And then we'll get into kind of more the practical, how do we go about doing this? How does this relate to all the um, you know, points of the NSDS lifecycle that you all have been learning about and some of the tools. And then I have, if you have time, we can do a little bit of uh, gender uh, discussion on, on gender statistics in the NSDS in, in your country. And of course, as, as Mary mentioned as well, we're really, really thrilled to have Lesotho um, presenting on gender as well. They've been one of our pilot countries for our gender statistics assessment. And so um, that'll be a really, I think, helpful way to see how this um, all works in practice. So just starting out, kind of laying some groundwork on what the essentials of gender statistics really are. And when we're talking about gender statistics, we're thinking about a number of different issues. So kind of um, the UNSC definition is that statistics, uh, gender statistics are statistics that adequately reflect differences and inequalities in the situation of women and men in all areas of life. And what this means is that it's um, there's quite a number of layers to it. So one is that we are talking about data that's sex disaggregated. Um, so that's probably one of the easiest ones, right? Thinking about differences in data between women and men and making sure that the data can reflect those. Then we have kind of a second category that's um, data that's about gender issues. So um, this would be something that is specific to um, women, for example, on something like, um, uh, you know, uh, fertility, for example, um, or uh, thinking about things like time use and unpaid care work. Those are things that have a very real gender sort of dimension to them. Um, ultimately, there's also um, a number of issues you have to think about. So in terms of reflecting the diversity of the population, I mean, this is a really important concept to have gender statistics because it's, it's an issue about representation. And then there's some issues you have to think about in terms of the whole data production process, which is how to avoid stereotypes, how to make sure that your survey questions are structured in a way that isn't going to um, result in kind of stereotypical or ex exclusive sort of results that um, would bias um, results from men versus women and things like this. So needless to say, if we're thinking about this kind of large definition, gender statistics are inherently cross-cutting. And you'll hear me say this multiple times during the presentation. It's really important to recognize that gender statistics have implication basically across all statistical fields. And, and we'll go into a little more detail. Um, so let's motivate this a little bit. It sounds pretty hard. You have to think about it at all stages of the data production process. It could have implications for how you publish data. It could have implications for what data you collect. So why do we need gender statistics? And really, the statistics on the situation of women and men are one of the ways to promote equality because it can inform public perceptions about gender and political perceptions about gender. Um, it, helps, it helps us understand um, women's and men's sort of lived experience and the difference between experiences. Um, ultimately, gender statistics really augment um, analysis and research because it helps us detect differences that we might not, not, might not be able to or might not expect. Um, 
One of the other, of course, really logical kind of use cases for gender statistics is to monitor progress for gender equality when you think of um, agendas like the SDGs and there's commitments there to gender equality. Um, we need to be able to monitor how we're achieving those. So fulfilling indicators um, is one big reason to, um, to work on gender statistics. Um, and then I guess relatedly is to create good policies, policies that are inclusive, policies that meet the needs of a broad and diverse population. So gender statistics are really important. Um, so let's just to make this really kind of concrete, let's talk about a couple examples. So I mentioned unpaid care work, for example, or household work. So when we're thinking about SDG six, for example, on clean water and sanitation, um, there's there's a difference between how women and men engage on collecting water. So women and girls are responsible on average for water collection in 80% of households without water on site. That's really significant. And ultimately, if we don't know that, it could have implications for women's safety and security. It could have implications for how much time girls spend in school. The more time that they're spending on other other tasks in the home that can that can ultimately affect their educational opportunities. There are all kinds of issues that should be considered um, because of a gender statistic like this. Um, another example related to the first SDG on poverty um, is that for every 100 men age 25 to 34, there are 122 women of the same age living in extreme poverty. So we know that poverty has a gendered dimension, which means that Ultimately, if your government is designing policies for poverty reduction, you need to understand the gender composition of, of, of poverty and gender statistics are an important way to do that. So now that we hopefully have kind of, we're starting from the same point, we have a little bit of an understanding of, of what gender statistics are, why they're important. Let's talk about how you actually make sure that you're producing the gender statistics that you need. And of course, this comes back to the NSCS. And what Paris 21 advocates for is a, a gender mainstreaming approach, which, which Mary also mentioned in the kind of titled presentation is, and this is another kind of point where I just wanna make sure we're on the same page. So what gender mainstreaming means is it's taking gender issues and gender-based biases into account in the production of official statistics and at all stages of data production. This is from IE. EIGE. Um, and it's an important, I, I think, point to just recognize, and hopefully it's coming through quite clearly now, that this has pretty significant implications for the design of an NSDS. There's a lot of different stages and, and phases where um, gender statistics can be taken into account, and ultimately that can improve the overall quality of the NSDS and the statistical strategy that you decide to take forward. And we'll talk a little bit more about that now. So why should we do this? Um, one is to respond to demand. And we kind of hinted at this earlier when we were talking about the SDGs, um, but Agenda 2063 and other um, even national development plans um, and national gender equality policies, they can include specific indicators for monitoring. And so ultimately, Producing gender statistics is a really important way to respond to demand for data. Um, we also know in kind of the wake of COVID-19 that there's already evidence to suggest that women and girls experienced a, a unique effect of the crisis. So gender statistics are even more important now. They've always been really, really important, but they, they're uniquely important now when we're thinking about um, women and girls who are on the front, front lines of healthcare workers in response, or women and girls who were taking up more um, duties at home with care work, um, with maybe um, family members who are ill and, and you know, childcare, these other issues. Um, there's also been an increase in violence against women, um, and what, what's been called the shadow pandemic by UN women. So these are all things where we need more data to be able to understand and ensure that we are working towards an inclusive recovery and, and data plays a really important part of that. So the second um, reason why to do this is um, to shed more light on vulnerable populations. And this is closely linked to what I was just speaking about, but we're talking about data segregation. And when I'm, I think um, one of the issues I also wanna highlight here 
is we immediately think of sex disaggregation um, oftentimes as kind of what a shorthand for gender statistics and vice versa. But when we really are thinking about analyzing gender uh, in official statistics, there are actually multiple disaggregations that might matter. So you might need to look at age, you might need to look at subnational uh, issues, you may need to look at um, things like migratory status. Those can all affect the experience of women and men differently. And so when we're talking about data disaggregation in the context of official statistics, generally more disaggregation is, is better. You still need to think about data protection, of course, but this is what a concept we would call intersectionality. The idea that multiple um, layers of vulnerability can stack on top of each other and make a person more vulnerable. And so it's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about demand for disaggregated data in the context of gender statistics, it's more than just sex disaggregation. The third point is on kind of the value of communicating granular data that are relatable to citizens. So when the public sees data that they relate to, that means something, actually promotes trust in the data that you're producing, right? If you see yourself, your life reflected in the data that's being produced, it, it has more credibility. And so um, ultimately for women and girls, seeing themselves reflected in the statistics that your, your, your institutions produce is a really important um, kind of way to build credibility and, and trust in the data. And fourth and finally, um, and this is one that's really quite exciting and, and I'll mention a number of times is, uh, is this idea that gender data is cross-cutting. And one of the things that we found as we've been working on this issue is that in many ways, gender statistics provide this sort of magnifying glass because it's cross-cutting on challenges in statistical capacity more broadly. And what this means is that if you're working on gender statistics and you start to solve some of these key challenges in coordination, for example, or communication, um, it can actually have kind of a net positive effect on statistical practice and statistical development overall. And so we'll talk a bit more about that. So when we're thinking about, you know, not just why um, gender statistics are relevant for the NSDS, we're thinking about why the NSDS is relevant for gender statistics. So think about kind of the other way around. and. Um, so the NSDS is a really critical moment to address gender data, data gaps. And there's, there's a few kind of key ways. So when we're thinking about that the NSDS is a process of strategic engagement, it's an opportunity to address relations and statistical production. Um, it's, it provides a front, you know, comprehensive policy framework to address uh, gender data gaps and also capacity gaps to make the supply of those data more regular. So it's just a really logical kind of entry point to start thinking about how do we make gender statistics better at the national level. There's also a political engagement dimension to the NSDS, and probably these things are fairly familiar to you, I assume, um, but the NSDS is political in nature. So it means that something that oftentimes doesn't get a lot of visibility, gender statistics, for example, it provides an opportunity to really document the need and raise the profile so that you can actually make some progress. And to go along with that, it makes it easier to mobilize the resources you need to close gender data gaps when you have them reflected in the NSDS because the NSDS should come with a budget. And um, so it, it basically provides some, some forward momentum to solve some of these challenges. And then third is the more participatory angle of what an NSDS is. Um, gender statistics ultimately, because they are such a so broad in their scope, there's a lot of different angles and expertise that you probably won't have just in the NSO. You need to collaborate with some other um, institutions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and also even the wider ecosystem beyond just government can really, the NSDS provides an opportunity to kind of bring these different stakeholders together and you know again raise the priority of gender issues in statistical practice and kind of move the ball forward in terms of opportunities for partnership and collaboration so the NSDS is just a really smart time to start thinking about how to improve gender statistics so 
what does this actually look like in practice? And when we're thinking about the NSCS life, NSCS life cycle, there are a few kind of key entry points where you need to think about bringing kind of a gender perspective through gender mainstreaming. One is in identifying and engaging stakeholders. And we'll talk about each of these in more detail, but um, a stakeholder mapping is generally what we suggest. Um, the second is in the assessment phase, which is a really big one. And that's what we're gonna hear um, Lasuti talk about in a few minutes, um, is really assessing data production, as well as kind of the enabling environment and capacity for gender statistics. So you kind of get a baseline of where you stand. And then third, not surprisingly, you use that assessment as a basis to form specific strategic objectives and actions um, to take forward in the NSDS. Um, and it should be reflected both in the overall document, hopefully, and also at the sector level. Again, we'll, we'll speak about this in a little bit more detail and hopefully it'll be a little clearer. So how do we go about doing this? Um, like I said, it kind of is relevant in all the different stages of the NSDS, um, the preliminary stage, the design stage, and the deployment stage. And one of the things that we recommend is that you consider, um, even though gender statistics is a cross-cutting issue, so it's kind of top level, that you actually consider a bottom-up approach as well. So you work consulting with the different sectors, um, as a way to kind of gain that broader picture that you need for the top-down approach. So um, that's that's one kind of uh, approach that you can take and, and we have some practical tools on how to do, how to help you do that. Um, I mentioned earlier, I think a great starting point is kind of a commitment to collect disaggregated data. There are special gender statistics on specific gender issues that we also can talk about, but including sex disaggregation, age disaggregation, and other, other levels that I was referencing earlier is a really positive step forward in improving gender statistics at the country level. Um, and then identifying what are the most salient gender issues at the sector level and the data needed to monitor progress. So this relates back to what I was speaking about with the SDGs or other policy commitments, things where um, you can kind of leverage this bottom up approach to understand demand for gender statistics in a little, a little better. Um, one important kind of point I have down here at the bottom um, is this idea of collaboration with the gender ministry. It might be the Ministry of Women, the Ministry of Gender, Gender Equality, Ministry of Family, sometimes the Ministry of Social Services. You would know which institution kind of holds this mandate in, in your context. It's a really important ally in the design of the NSDS when it, when it comes to gender statistics because they are, they're going to have a much um, they're going to be much more grounded in kind of the national policy context of what what gender data needs there might be they are gender data users themselves probably they're probably gender data producers and so a collaboration between the nso and the lead ministry on gender i think is a really powerful um pairing to take forward um gender statistics in the nsds so i know i'm already kind of going a bit at warp speed, um, but so far we've gone through kind of what gender statistics are, why they matter, and how roughly they relate to the NSDS. I wanted to pause here um, in case there were any questions um, from, the, from the group, and just a couple minutes in case people would like to come in with a, a question or a clarification before I go forward. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren? Yes. And uh, I can't see any questions. Please, participants, you can actually ask questions. You can use the reactions button, or you can uh, just unmute and ask a question. Kindly, those who have any questions or those who have any clarifications, please feel free to ask. I see Isaac. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, go good, good morning, afternoon, Mary. Um, <clears throat> I just want to, to, to find out, um, and maybe this has been going on for quite some time because uh, in so many cases, I've realized that uh, the difference between sex and, and gender 
uh, start to play a bigger role. Maybe you can just explain what do you mean by gender, uh, you know, uh, sure. you know, incorporated NSDS. Thank you. Yeah, it's Lauren, excellent. Lauren, before yes. you answer, kindly please, could we get like two questions and yes, then you course. respond to Isaac and uh, Emmanuel? Yes, of kindly. course. Okay, thank you. Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you so much and good morning to everyone and uh, happy we are meeting today. And thank you for the presentation, Lauren. Uh, it's such a wonderful presentation. But a couple of clarification I want to seek. I also want to find out first if you mean, uh, what you mean by equality uh, when talking about gender statistics as against equity. And then when you say NSDS, is political in nature, what do you really mean? Because from where some of us are coming from, whenever anything becomes political, it manifests itself in various ways, most of the time in the negative way, and then the desired result is not achieved. So if you can explain what you mean by the NSDS being political, I'll be very grateful and appreciative. Thank you, Enova. Yeah, thank Thanks you, so much, Emmanuel and Isaac. Lauren, you are ready to go. Kindly respond to those two questions. Yes, very happy to. Um, you guys are asking me conceptual questions, which is uh, you're you're going to test my my knowledge here. But um, no, so gender uh, and and sex. Um, thanks so much, Isaac, for asking the question. I know. Um, the terminology is is quite important and and um, quite can be quite confusing. Um, so there are different approaches on on how to address this, and actually there are um, trainings that can be done also to kind of explore these kinds of issues in greater depth. And I actually I'll I'll go ahead and say Emmanuel the the question on equity and equality. Um, I myself. I uh, don't have a great answer to that question at the moment. So I'm gonna come back to you with um, a little bit more clarification on what this actually means in terms of um, statistical practice. Ultimately, it's defined by the policies that you're pursuing. And I think that this comes back to the political question. So I'll come back to you in a minute. But for sex and gender, um, basically the definitions that we uh, suggest in our frameworks is that sex refers to the biological characteristics of um, male and female. Um, there are also other kind of definitions around this and issues around um, non-binary um, uh, identifications, but that's kind of the, the basic answer on what sex is, is we're referring to the biological dimension. With gender, gender is socially constructed. So this is how we expect women and men to behave. This is how we expect women and men to, um, what kind of roles they, um, they are typically assigned in society, what kind of uh, behaviors are expected of them and um, what cultural norms exist that are um, around kind of gender roles. Um, so that's kind of roughly the delineation. So. Um, when I'm thinking of something like unpaid care work, the reason why I'm referring to that as being an issue in gender statistics is because we know the roles of men and women in the home are often different. Um, but that's not because of their biological sex. That's because of the expectations of society and culture that have been built up around those roles. Um, hopefully that helps with some clarification. I can also send um, some materials as well if you have uh, more interest in this area. For Emmanuel, um, like I said, I'll follow up more on equity and equality, but the main point for the purposes of statistical practice is that it should be based on what is uh, the policy objectives that are linked to the country context, right? Um, so in terms of definitions of equality and equity or what kind of a agenda is being pursued um, in, in 
particular country context, that's kind of what matters in this particular instance. And when I'm talking about the NSS being political, I'm not talking about it in quite this negative connotation. And I really appreciate you asking the question. I'm more referring to it more in a practical sense that um, the NSDS typically has to be approved through a political process. Um, sometimes it's it, it can happen at different levels, but there's kind of a, a political approval around the NSDS and why that matters in the context of gender statistics is because often gender statistics we find um, are not necessarily that um, prominent um, in, in national statistics. And so the NSDS provides kind of this entry point to put gender statistics visibly on the agenda and then obtain approval to do so through the usual channels we would pursue to approve an NSDS. And that's more what I'm referring to when I'm talking about um, the political engagement aspect. Um, so I don't want to hold on. Lauren, you got me? Yes, I just realized I, I, I want to go ahead and restart my presentation because I know time is running and there's quite a lot still to get through. Sorry, it's so slow. Okay, so back on track. Let's talk about gender statistics and the NSDF life cycle. So we've talked just now briefly about what the entry points are in broad terms, what some approaches are, but we're gonna dig into this a little bit so that it's a little bit more practical and active. So you should hopefully be familiar with the NSDS life cycle now. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the preliminary stage and engaging stakeholders, because this is very important really for an NSDS. Generally, it's exceptionally important for an issue like gender statistics where um, there are so many different layers and you need to draw in some, some additional expertise probably. So we suggest that you go through some kind of process of mapping the gender data ecosystem. And what I mean by that is that you're looking at the national statistical system and the government agencies that are engaged. So who's producing administrative data, for example, that might be really important for gender statistics, but also thinking about maybe external stakeholders like academia or NGOs and civil society or the private sector and the international community that may also be producing their own sources of gender data or they also may be really important users of gender statistics. Um, so I also mentioned the second bullet, bullet point here, which is that you should seek support from the institutional response, institution responsible for advancing gender equality or gender equity in your country. Um, and that is typically a ministry of women, but it may be embedded in a different kind of institution. So depending on the context, but they're a very, very important ally, as I mentioned. Um, and then I think that there's an important part of kind of designating in the context of the NSDS design to just to define some roles um, in the in designing the gender statistics strategy, you know, marking opportunities for collaboration. It can also kind of set the stage for a better implementation as well, because you're kind of opening these channels um, for for dialogue, which takes me to my next point. Um, so engaging stakeholders, creating space for dialogue. This is once you've met your stakeholders in the country, um, setting up points of dialogue is really going to be key. Um, gender data gaps often are quite hidden. You might not be fully aware of them. So widening the groups that you speak to is I think really, really important. So one place you can start though, is even starting internally in the NSO, different departments that might be producing key statistics on um, sex disaggregated data on education, for example, or you know, there, there may be a number of different 
examples that might not might be the education statistics may come somewhere else, but um, you, you get my point that actually understanding a little bit of what's happening in house in the NSO is a really good place to start. Going to line ministries, talking about this kind of bottom up approach we were talking about earlier, this can be helpful both in understanding demand for gender data and also becoming more aware of kind of the breadth of the concept of gender statistics. And so that's, that's one thing that's also important to consider. And then dialoguing with users and folks outside of government, like I was talking about earlier. Um, this is, uh, the more you do this, the more likely you're going to develop gender statistics strategies that are really powerful and salient to for, for policy use and impact. And that's that's exciting and important. Okay, so in the preliminary stage, again, we think a little bit about, okay, you've You've mapped the ecosystem, you've started some dialogue. How do you kind of set up the right mechanisms to, uh, to, to bring this forward? And here we, we have our political support uh, context here. So looking for leaders, um, uh, this is a positive way of looking for people who are gonna champion um, this issue. I think that that's, that's a great way again, and you can, I think that's where coordination um, with the lead ministry on gender or gender equality can be really helpful. Assigning roles and responsibilities around gender data in the NSDS. So who kinds of kind of owns different statistical products? Where are the opportunities for collaboration? Um, this can be, I think, really helpful in setting yourself up to succeed in integrating gender in the NSDS. And then also, this is a great moment to speak with development partners and, and funders, ultimately. Um, many development partners really value efforts toward gender equality, and so this can be a great point of discussion with them around the NSDS is to discuss how to advance on gender statistics. So uh, another important institutional mechanism is launching uh, some kind of communications and media strategy to reach different audiences. Audiences for gender statistics are incredibly diverse very similar to audiences for official statistics are generally very diverse. Um, so it's really a smart idea to start communicating around the development of the gender statistics strategy from the beginning, rather than waiting until you have a strategy in place. Mobilizing some um, media attention around this uh, can be really helpful in kind of moving the process forward. and also engaging external institutions like we we're talking about that may not be as aware of what an NSDS best is or why it might be relevant for them in the area of gender statistics, gender equality. Um, this also sets the stage ultimately because it's great to be communicating as you implement your NSDS, so to kind of start as you intend to proceed. <clears throat> so when we think about this kind of all important step of assessing gender statistics. Um, there are some existing tools that can help you do this. So you, you're in place, you've got your, you've mapped out your gender data ecosystem, you've set up your mechanisms, you've opened channels for dialogue. Now is the time to really benchmark, okay, where do we stand? Where do we wanna go? And um, in partnership with you and women, we were really pleased to produce um, this great guide. It's an assessment framework and guidelines um, for gender statistics, and it's specifically designed um, to support you in the NSDS design process. That's really the intent is that out of this assessment process, you can develop gender statistics strategies. Um, so it includes really two parts, which I'll, I'll talk about next. Um, one is to assess gender data gaps or gender statistics gaps. Um, and we suggest using ADAPT. I think you guys just heard about ADAPT yesterday. So we have some tools in ADAPT that allow you to, to do this specifically for gender statistics, which is a great tool. Um, but you can also do this other ways if you're, if you're not gonna use ADAPT, but um, it, is, it is something we've done and, and do support countries to do. And then the second is to assess capacity gaps, which we use the CD 4.0 framework to pass capacity development 4.0, which I think maybe you all also had a bit of an introduction to. Um, for this piece, we actually have developed four questionnaires that are included in that gender statistics assessment framework and users. 
um, so that you have some idea of where to start together into an assessment report. And that really serves as sort of the basis to develop um, a gender statistics strategy and mainstream gender in the MSDS. <clears throat> so how does this assessment work? <laughs> um, for the data gaps piece, um, this is really, uh, the starting point is kind of agreeing on what is kind of the priority framework for gender statistics? How do we define demand for gender statistics? And this should ideally come from looking at indicator framework policy commitment. So the SDGs, African Union Agenda 2063, the plan and other frameworks that are specific to your context. And you kind of develop a base framework of the gender statistics that are in the country. And like I said, this is kind of ensuring that what you're what you're going to set out to do and the gaps you're going to intend to fill are actually responding to demand. Um, this is also a great way by linking it explicitly to policies that your government is signed on to. This is a great way to mobilize support and funding. And, and so that's a, another positive aspect of this. Um, and quick reminders again on consulting the gender ministry and probably the Ministry of Finance and Planning um, on, on this step to make sure that the framework that you develop for gender statistics that demand is really in sync with, with these other key stakeholders and what they what their views are on this issue. <clears throat> so once you have kind of an understanding and an assessment of data gaps and capacity gaps, then it's about how to shift that into something that's actionable and meaningful um, for gender statistics. And one of the things we really uh, encourage you to do is to kind of adopt a human rights-based approach to data and statistics to advance gender statistics. So this relates to what I was speaking about earlier on data disaggregation. There are rights issues as well in there. You wanna think about privacy and you know, transparency, these kinds of issues when you're disaggregating data, obviously some data is sensitive, so you need to have some safeguards in place. But ultimately, um, Focusing on gender statistics is about making statistical practice more inclusive and participatory. And I hope that that's really coming through um, in this presentation. And we have some uh, suggestions, great more details on what this means in practice, also in um, uh, a forthcoming module on the gender statistics uh, guidelines within the framework of the NSDS guidelines. Um, the uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, I made a reference to the issue on representation. Um, ultimately, bringing gender statistics into official statistics is about making statistics more representative of the population. It's something we should all be trying to do. And so these are principles that are certainly very relevant to gender statistics, but ultimately this will, by kind of adopting this lens and keeping people at the center of your approach, you're going to strengthen the NSDS quality overall as well. So adopting a gender lens throughout the whole NSDS process, and this is kind of what I was talking about just now. Let's we talked a bit about going bottom up and I'm gonna come back to it in a minute of working with the different sectors and kind of identifying needs at the sector level and then moving that up. We can also think of a top-down kind of approach, which is that we take these principles about being you know, kind of human rights centered and we adopt a gender sensitive approach through the full NSDF's life cycle. And hopefully it's clearer now how to do that. There's, um, you know, a lot of different ways you can kind of contextualize it to your uh, particular needs. But um, what we would like to see is in the overall NSDS document is that there's an explicit commitment to advance gender statistics. So um, by making that commitment up top, it can also then be reflected and mirrored in any sectoral strategies that are also being developed alongside the NSDS. But you could think of this as like, a pillar of an NSDS. Um, that's what uh, our, we had a pilot in Senegal and that was ultimately the, the approach they pursued. Or you could have um, individual strategic objectives within different pillars, um, but something that's reflected at a high level 
um, in, in the NSDS strategic framework design is preferable. So um, when we're thinking about this bottom up, up approach, that's top down, when we're thinking about bottom up approach, we want to uh, make sure that we're remembering that gender statistics are cross cutting area, meaning that they should be brought in on all the sectors and different statistical domains as much as possible. So education, health, agriculture, labor market, other key areas of statistics, there's a gender dimension and, and ideally you wanna see that those commitments are reflected there. Um, one of the things we, we talked a little bit about, you know, if, you, if you're successful in mobilizing all these different stakeholders um, around the design of a gender statistics strategy, a, another great thing to do, and you can actually have an explicit commitment around this in the NSDS potentially, is to establish, if you don't have one already, some kind of interagency mechanism for gender statistics, so sort of a coordination framework. This can be helpful both in designing the, the gender statistics strategy, but ultimately also for implementing it as well. Um, and like I said, I mean, you want kind of the core NSDS document, and I'm sure that uh, there's been discussion about this before, but the core NSDS document and any sectoral strategies should be, you know, related to each other, <laughs> obviously. Um, and you could think about highlighting it in, in kind of a section on cross-cutting areas. That would be a logical place to identify that gender statistics is not just limited to the overall document, but it's also reflected in these, um, you know, if you're going to include additional sector-specific strategies, for example. So as I mentioned, um, really you wanna ground your strategic framework in the findings from the assessment. That's why we do the assessment, obviously. Um, when you're thinking about what kinds of activities or targets you wanna set for yourself, you wanna keep gender data gaps front and center. So this is closing gaps related to sex disaggregation or other levels of disaggregation, or perhaps it could also be new survey modules or new survey exercises, for example, on a new topic. So um, I, I know I keep using this example, but it's a good one. Some countries are now doing, and there's probably a few of you who have done things like a time use survey or a violence against women survey. That's to close a specific gender data gap. Those are other types of exercises you could do to, to improve gender statistics. Um, but you can also think about the capacity gaps that you learned from your assessment and how that might affect um, the, you know, the landscape for gender statistics in your country. So maybe you want to have a target related to communication of gender statistics or coordination around gender statistics, for example. Um, if you want more ideas on, you know, particular sectors or specific issues, we will have a resources section in this new guideline um, in the NSDS guidelines specifically on gender statistics. One quick note, even though we do really highly recommend having gender statistics mainstream throughout your whole NSDS, we recognize like sometimes this just isn't a very viable approach just depending on the context or perhaps you already have an NSDS and but it doesn't have gender and you want to add it. You can develop a sort of standalone strategy that's a gender statistics strategy. We don't like this as much because it's not necessarily cross-cutting, but it, and sometimes it really is a really useful way to raise the visibility of gender statistics, especially if it's the first time you're trying to gender mainstream. Um, the one word of caution is you, you still want it aligned with the overall NSDS because if it feels very disconnected, it's gonna be harder to mobilize resources and you know momentum around it. So just to keep that in mind, if that's a better approach for your context. And then last, I mean, really when we're thinking about the deployment stage, the work doesn't end, right? Um, ultimately, you wanna make sure that you're retaining a gender lens and how you're implementing your NSDS. So that means having gender sensitive communication and disseminating key messages on the role of gender statistics and how it relates to the NSDS implementation. It's the kind of capacity development angle to make sure you can deliver on the commitments that you've set out in, in your NSDS related to gender statistics. Um, and I mentioned earlier, establishing or 
reinvigorating um, mechanisms to coordinate implementation of gender statistics. And this is great for kind of knowledge exchange and peer learning, like a thematic working group, for example, um, and to make sure that you, you're coordinated and uh, to reduce duplication of effort. Um, and then another one we really recommend is that you continue to engage with advocates of gender equality um, because ultimately not only are they key users, but they're they're really allies, I think, in the implementation of a gender statistics strategy. So it's good to keep reaching out to them. Evaluations are also important. Um, so midterm evaluation, it's a great entry point, actually, if you're trying to add um, gender statistics to an existing NSDS, uh, you can create a standalone strategy that's aligned to the strategic framework and kind of start implementing it at the midterm point. Um, and just generally, it's a a great stock take, but that would be true for, for any area of statistics, right? Um, once you have gender in the strategy, it's really important to make sure that you're evaluating at the final stage as well, because that, of course, sets the stage for this constant life cycle where you can you can continue to advance on gender statistics as you as you plan your next NSCS. And that is the last slide. Um, so I'm happy to take more questions or comments if people would like. Um, and then if there's some time for discussion, I defer to you, Mary, on um, the timings for the day. But uh, we do have some discussion questions if people would like to have a little bit of discussion time. Thanks so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Loren. That was quite a good presentation. Before we go to the questions and answers, I've seen Gloria has tried to define for us in the chat the difference between gender equality and gender equity. So Thanks I so think much, that's Gloria. a question from Emmanuel. You can check through the chat, please. You'll see what gender equality is. The absence of a discrimination on the basis of a person's sex, while gender equity is more or less among the processes of being fair to men and women, whichever gender is uh, more vulnerable. So for discussions, I can see we have a question from Yandiswa. Any other reactions? Okay, Yandiswa, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Lauren, for such a great presentation. I was wondering though, when you segment your stakeholders, whether it's not important to mention civil society organizations by name, because many a times the, the um, CSOs that deal with gender issues are the ones that keep government um, you know, on the straight and narrow on gender issues. That maybe rather than saying that other users of uh, gender statistics, we should mention them by name. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Yaniswa. And yeah, actually, uh, you caught me caught me out for sure. We talk about civil society a lot at Paris 21 and the role that they play uh, potentially as, as catalysts to improve gender statistics. And I, I do apologize for not mentioning them explicitly today. Um, but yeah, I would I would say they are arguably one of the most important stakeholders. And um, especially when uh, what I was referencing earlier, one of the reasons to take this multi-stakeholder approach and seek out these other institutions is because um, they often have a deeper sense, deeper knowledge of the gender issues on the ground. Because um, uh, the NSO is, of course, you are experts on, on, on statistics and um, it's hard to be an expert on everything. Um, but uh, civil society can be very well connected and really understand um, the needs and challenges uh, in the area of gender. And so that can be a really important kind of ally. I think we also are starting to look into issues, for example, of how to use unofficial sources to help close gender data gaps. And citizen generated data is a great example where civil society organizations may have um, existing data that could potentially be useful or at least instructive um, in, in and closing some gender data gaps. That's a, a whole other issue. It's a whole different training. Um, but uh, yeah, for sure, gen, uh, civil society organizations, I think, should be specifically engaged and, um, and uh, you know, consulted with when you're developing a gender statistics strategy and when you're, when you're moving to implementation. Thanks so much. That's a really thoughtful remark. 
So thank you. I do not see any other reactions. I assume that it was quite clear for us. Right. And uh, yeah, thank you, Lorraine. And uh, for the group discussion, I'm thinking we may be a bit short of time. No problem. So maybe let us uh, get the presentation from Lesotho and uh, time allowing, maybe we can share the questions with the team such that they can at least benefit from what it is that uh, was to be discussed. So if that is okay, we can move on to yes. Lesotho to give us their presentation. Selena, kindly. <laughs> hello, <laughs> can you hear me? I Hello. We, hello. Can hear you. we can hear you. Yes, um, I, I, I have a, a very weak and unstable network. Uh, so I, I don't know, I'm just hoping it will take me through. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Selina Malato. I come from the Bureau of Statistics Lesotho. Um, I'm going to share Lesotho's experience in the mainstreaming of gender statistics in the process of um, the, our NSDS2 development process. Um, I don't know whether Lauren, can you can you share my presentations? Because from this side, I know I am going to have challenges. Uh, Elise, uh, Lauren, I, Lauren. I, uh, Philippe, Elise or Philippe, will you be able to help? Yes, yes, please. Uh, oh, <laughs> Selena, uh, have you shared your presentation? Uh, Ali and uh, Elise can take care of it, please. Yeah, I, I shared it with Lauren and yourself, I think. Um, I don't know whether you received it, can you check? It was because I knew that uh, it wasn't going to be easy for me to share it from this side. Yes, sure, we did. Uh, Elise, we shared it with, with, with us. Please. And and also I'll do the presentation without a video because I have a very weak network here. And um, Philippe, I haven't received it on my side. You haven't? No. Oh. Okay. I think I did. Let me share it uh, from my 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 end. Yes, thank you very much. I, I'll keep on, you You will help me scroll down. Uh, I don't know, is it you, Filippi? Yes, please. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me continue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I've said, um, I'm going to just share with you uh, how uh, Lesotho Bureau of Statistics mainstreamed uh, we, uh, actually the process of mainstreaming the gender statistics in the process of the national uh, strategy for de the development of uh, statistics. And that is our second strategy that we are uh, actually developing. So what I'm going to talk about here is briefly the, our mandate as the National Statistics Office the background to our uh, NSDS2 development, the methodologies and approaches that we followed in this process, uh, and now a bit of the, the key findings of the gender assessment and what are our challenges and the conclusions. I don't know, I thought I had also recommendations, but it's okay. Uh, um, colleagues, uh, um, the, the Bureau of Statistics uh, is, is mandated by the Act of uh, 2001 to produce statistics 
or especially official statistics, we we collect, analyze, and disseminate these official statistics. Uh, that is our main mandate. We are also mandated as the National Statistics Office to, <clears throat> sorry, to coordinate the national statistical system. I, I guess we all uh, know that coordination of uh, the NSS uh, implies that you ensure, you make sure as the NSO that uh, the data that would have been produced by the by the MDAs is in line with the best practices, the best manuals that we know for each of the areas of this of statistics that we are expected to compile in the across the national uh, statistical system. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, I should also share with you that um, uh, Lesotho is in the in the process of uh, implementation of uh, the, NS, the NSDS2. I should also brief you that uh, we started developing and implementing the, uh, the first NSDS uh, between the years 2006-07 and it ended in 2016-17. And thereafter, we undertook an evaluation in 2019 with uh, the assistance of 20, I mean, of Paris 21. And um, that evaluation was now an exercise that was going to help us in the, for, in the formulation of uh, the next strategy, which uh, commenced its development process in August last year. And in this um, process, our, our main aim uh, this time around was to focus on uh, mainstreaming the gender statistics in the process of the NSDS2 development. Another, another main focus of, of this uh, development process is to also see how um, we, we can modernize our NSS, you know, as it has always been uh, said that uh, now we should adopt new technologies and we should include new data sources and we should exploit admin data. So this is one of our 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 main focus of in, in the development of this uh, uh, NSDS two. Now in this process, we are being assisted. Uh, technically and financially by Paris 21. And uh, in their assistance, they, they provided, they engaged uh, four consultants, one, one international consultant and one a national consultant for the main strategy. Uh, the gen, they also engaged the gender um, specialist to help us mainstreaming in the mainstreaming process. They also helped us engage a, a, a consultant uh, for ADAPT. And ADAPT is what has been discussed, you know, in most of uh, the presentation this week. Now, what is the uh, methodologies or approaches we followed? Uh, as I've said, the, uh, the first approach that, the, the, that we followed was to take an assessment. And I have emphasized that this assessment was also uh, uh, led by the, the findings of the um, uh, of the of the evaluation that we did. Uh, now we took an assessment. How did we do that? Uh, we had been assisted uh, by Paris Twenty One as well to to come up with the uh, the, the questionnaires that we were going to ask uh, the uh, the MDAs in order to assess their capacities. And to, to in terms of um, you know um, the IT infrastructure, in terms of the skills and so on and so and so forth. So this uh, this this assessment was done by the consultants. They also reviewed the existing literature in terms of uh, you know using what 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 um, findings what. Um, uh, publications and also the evaluation uh, uh, process, uh, the report that, that was done as a result of the evaluation to, to for this exercise. 
Now, in our in our assessment, we as we were working with the MDAs, uh, visiting them face to face wherever there was that was possible, and sometimes working with them remotely uh, through virtual meetings, asking them questions on their capacities, what they would like to see in the next strategy, and so forth, depending on the the questionnaire. So that was the approach that was followed. The other approach was the, the ADAPT tool that uh, has been talked about uh, uh, throughout the, the week uh, in during the presentations of this training. So that, that ADAPT tool also was another approach that we used. And this enabled us uh, to get the, the, the demand and supply of, 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 of data in terms of policies and indicators. Uh, I guess you, it was explained what the, the, the ADAPT tool is, so we, you, you know, but this is one of the approaches we followed. We also, um, in the assessment, we also employed the CD 4.0 uh, approach, which has also been explained to what it is. And um, we, we did that through three p major pillars, the system, the organization, and the individual as you know it. And for each pillars, you know that there are targets for attention in terms of resources, skills, and knowledge, and management, politics, and power, and intense in, in incentives. In addition, a questionnaire on gender specifically was administered along with the, the, the other questionnaire. Uh, this questionnaire, which was focusing mainly on the demand and supply of uh, gender statistics by each and every MDA that we visited. And I must, I must also uh, inform you that it's not only MDAs that we visited, it was also developing partners, it was also COA, CSOs and other others, uh, other 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 sections of the um, of 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 our of our, our country. So can you can you can you go to the next slide? Yes. Now, having done all this assessment, having circulated all this questionnaire, asking the MDAs what data they would like to have in terms of gender and do what would they want to see produced in terms of uh, of gender now we uh, the consultant sat down and uh, analyzed this 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 data and here are some of the key findings that now um, here in lesotho um out, we, we have uh, about 152 uh, indicators that we follow as a country. And I, I must explain that uh, I'm talking about the indicators of the, the SDG indicators. And I must, uh, I must also uh, inform you that they are aligned with the NSDP2. The NSDP is the National Strategy, Strategic Development Plan of the country. So uh, our strategy as a country has its own indicators, and those indicators are aligned with the indicators of the other uh, international or regional uh, 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 framework so that we don't duplicate um, uh, once we monitor or we generate data for one indicator, then it could also be used in another framework and so on and so forth. So we are following only 152, but uh, uh, according and according to the findings, we found out that only data is only available uh, for 101 indicators. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So now, out of this 152, we also found out that. 44, I mean, um, yes, 44, uh, uh, 44, um, or I could just say 29% of those are gender related. 
And for those 29%, uh, uh, we only have data uh, for about 84% of, of those indicators. So I'm saying we have in total 152, and I'm saying that 44 of those are gender related. And then uh, we have data only for two, data for about 37 of them. Uh, next slide, please. And now we also um, looked at uh, those for four uh, gender related indicators and realized that most of the data, uh, mo mo most of these gender related indicators are found if you look at the SDGs uh, in goals one, two, three, four, and five. So most of them pertain to the people's goals. Thank you, and please, next slide. Now, what are the challenges that we encountered as, we, 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 as this was done? Uh, or the, the challenges that are indicated in the assessment. The assessment points out that um, uh, most D MDAs do not compile gender-related uh, SDGs or, or indicators of the the national development plans, if I can use that. Uh, there's also uh, the general challenge of lack of capacity uh, and skills on gender issues. Um, here in Lesotho, they, uh, I remember even from our side as, as the Bureau of Statistics, we were always wondering uh, what what gender aspects we were expected to produce other than just collect other than mainly collecting data uh, on sex so the the the, the challenge was even um, experienced by by the bureau of statistics now low use of administrative data does not only apply to gender statistics we 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 as a country and across the NSS, we, we realized that uh, there isn't much uh, of the data used from administrative records, mainly because we, as a country, we are still uh, uh, having challenges of developing systems uh, across these uh, uh, ministries and some of the departments. A few, a few um, systems do exist in the country. We also have a low budget for gender related activities. I think this does not only apply for, for, for gender statistics, but uh, for all statistics in the country, there's a low budget. That is one of uh, our challenges that was indicated in the, in, the, in, the, in the assessment. And lack of priority setting for gender. Yes, I think, I guess this one comes mainly from the fact that uh, uh, MDAs, as we were talking to them, and I must, uh, I must inform you that I, I was part of the, the consultants in some of the, the, when they visited some of the, the MDAs. So they would just say because they didn't have that uh, knowledge of what gender statistics they are supposed to produce, and so they, they, they don't even prioritize uh, the gender uh, disaggregated uh, uh, activities. So that was one of the challenges. Next slide, please. And then there were recommendations in this assessment. Now, we were, we were advised to, uh, okay, on organ, organizational setup, we were, I advise to review the organizational structures of the MDAs. We were also advised to improve coordination among MDAs. I guess coordination and leadership among MDAs and other producers of gender-related uh, data. Uh, and I must say that uh, here in Lesotho, leadership uh, in statistics, uh, we we don't only look at it from a perspective of uh, uh, our seniors and so forth. We also look at it from the perspective of the 
uh, of data producers, data providers, and data users that everyone else of uh, within those uh, uh, three groups, if they know their roles properly, then our our leadership would have been improved. Uh, so, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Way forward, yes, the way forward. No, you can go to the, the way forward. Yes, thank you. The way forward is that since we are still uh, we we are still in the in the process in the in the design process, we have uh, we are at a point where, as the bureau, we have just um, developed the uh, strategic foundations, and we are yet to uh, also talk to the MDAs uh, about the strategic foundation so that they can form part of that and uh, come up with their inputs and suggestions on those. Uh, now, what we did was to formulate a, a mission statement uh, uh, that emphasize, emphasizes gender, uh, uh, gender statistics as a priority. Our mission has included gender as a priority uh, for the for the five coming years that the strategy would be running. We have also included some strategic objectives that are focusing on gender. We are also going to assist the MDAs to identify the minimum essential indicators for gender statistics. And this will also be identified in their sector plans for, for statistics. Uh, yes, these are some of the things we do. We are, we are, we are looking forward to, do, to doing for gender. Uh, next, next slide, please. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Selena, for that good presentation. We are happy the internet did not disappoint. And uh, we've overshot our time a bit, but I think it was important for us to get that experience, practical experience from a country that has used ADAPT, that has used the CD4, and that has actually mainstreamed gender in the NSDS process. So kindly, we can take maybe one or two minutes for reactions. Any reactions on that presentation? Is there any hand up? I can't see any. We are all comfortable. Okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll continue reacting through the chats. But uh, at this moment, if uh, there are no hands up, then uh, I will welcome Philip to take us through the next presentation on fragility, crisis, and uh, strategic statistical planning. Philip, kindly take us through the, your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Mary, I, I, I'm trying to fix a bit my, uh, my presentation from here, just coming soon. Yeah, uh, please let me know if you can see my. Yes, it works. Slide here. Yes, we can see it. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, Atra, thank you, uh, 
Lorraine and uh, Selina for your, your, your presentations on, on, on gender uh, statistics mainstreaming in the, the NSDS. Uh, this is quite important. Uh, the next uh, topic will be on crisis. Yeah, I'm not big at the continue. Participants, kindly mute mute your mic so that we don't get a uh, disturbance. Yeah. Th th thank you. So uh, the next uh, topic will be on uh, crisis, fragility, and uh, uh, statistical strategic planning. And uh, here we, we just discuss uh, together on how we can go about uh, statistical strategic planning during uh, crisis situations. Uh, the outline uh, will be uh, just defining what is crisis, what is fragility, and how do we go about uh, crisis management and how we proceed uh, with the NSDS uh, process in this situation. And then we can discuss. It will be just uh, a discussion, uh, more a discussion than uh, a formal uh, presentation as such. And then we have later uh, a country presentation from, from uh, Libya, and then we can have uh, uh, discussions. So, uh, what is a crisis indeed? Uh, we, we, we all know uh, that uh, many studies uh, and documentations uh, have concluded that uh, disaster and disaster risks uh, have increased, of course, over the years and are expected uh, to rise further. And we can take the experience even from the, the crisis uh, brought about the pandemic itself uh, the pandemic, I, I mean here, uh, the, the coronavirus, uh, the, the, the corona, uh, the, uh, virus that we are experiencing now uh, in the world. And uh, by defining the crisis, uh, the crisis is the disruption that physically affects a, a system as a whole and uh, uh, threatens its basic assumptions, its uh, subjective sense of self and its existential core. Uh, it is a situation faced by an individual group of organization, which they are uh, enabled to cope with by the use of normal routine procedures and in which stress is created by sudden change. So we, we all actually live this uh, kind of situations when there is a crisis, uh, but also uh, it is a critical situation uh, where the, the functioning or, or, or survival of an individual community organization uh, or state are threatened. It can also strike anyone, anytime and anywhere. A crisis has three key features, as you, you, might, you might imagine, you might imagine it is unexpected, unique, and largely uncomfortable. It affects something or someone's ability to function or survive. And of course, some crises occur from natural disaster, uh, national dis disturbances. Others arise out uh, of technological breakdown or human misconduct. So I will not spend a lot of time uh, defining this. Uh, we all know uh, that uh, uh, this affects not only uh, people as individuals, but also uh, the system, the organizations, including the national statistical systems, of course. So what is fragility? Uh, you, 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 you will see that uh, actually there are uh, similar situations, but here the OECD uh, uh, defines fragility uh, as the combination of exposure to risk and insufficient coping capacity of the state systems and or communities 
to manage, absorb, or mitigate those risks. Fragility also can lead to negative outcomes, including violence, poverty, inequality, displacement, and environmental and political uh, degra degradation. Uh, fragility is measured on a spectrum of intensity and expressed in different ways across the economic, environmental, political security, and societal dimensions. But what about the national statistical systems? Of course, in these situations, the national statistical systems are heavily affected as well. So you can see that uh, uh, like in other systems as well, other institutions as well, there are losses or damages of resources. And in, in terms of national statistical systems, uh, we lost statistical resources. This might be human resources. It can be uh, statistical infrastructure and so on. But during the crisis, there is also a competition uh, with government priorities. I mentioned, I want to mention here that uh, the competition with other government priorities, I, I'm, I'm mentioning the priority statistics priorities and other government priorities. When there is a crisis, when there is a, a, a fragility situation, the government uh, puts priority in uh, very specific selected priorities. For example, uh, during the COVID-19, the government puts uh, emphasis on how to overcome the immediate health consequences uh, from the COVID-19. When you talk about statistics, probably they will not even understand what is it. Yet, without good statistics, it will be very, very difficult to overcome or even to plan for delivering proper measures to fight against the COVID-19. Now, we need to manage the crisis. And as the, the national statistical systems and the national statistical offices, how do we go about it? Uh, most of developing countries, uh, they are affected, of course, heavily affected even uh, compared to developing uh, developed countries because of lack of resources and also uh, institutional setting. But it is very essential for the national statistical uh, offices that national statistical systems in these conditions to have a specific and comprehensive preparedness and response plan in place. When you take the example or the experience uh, from the COVID-19, this was a crisis that happened and nobody, no one, was prepared for it. But it's very important that when we plan for the national statistical uh, systems, when we plan through our national statistical uh, strategy, we should imagine all kind of disaster related risks that can happen and take it into consideration during our process. So we need to have a uh, preparedness plan to respond to those type of crises. So that's why we need to have a very good uh, uh, risk and risk mitigation analysis and how we can go about it when it happens. Now, during this crisis, we have a lot of challenges uh, with the NSS, uh, and uh, you have experienced this actually uh, directly with the current crisis. You have increased data demand from everywhere. Everyone needs immediate quality data. This is a combination of things that requires uh, innovation mechanisms to cope with that uh, 
uh, increased uh, data demand. At the same time, the NSS, the NSOs, they don't have the capacity to cope with this uh, uh, high demand. And as well, they might not have the capacity to innovate. In addition to, to, to this, you also now have competition from the data ecosystem. One, the NSO, the MDS that are supposed to produce the data, uh, timely data and good data to inform the crisis uh, uh, decision making, let me uh, put it that way, they don't have that capacity. And then other producers, other data producers will go ahead and produce data. And you have seen it uh, during this period of uh, COVID-19 that we did have conflicting data coming from all over the place, from private sector, from using a lot of data solutions, and sometimes co co contracting even or, or, or contradicting even the data from the national statistical system, and it creates a problem. So this competition uh, brings about a problem of coordination, problem of communication. How do you communicate your data? How do you coordinate the data coming from other uh, data ecosystem providers to make sure that you, you are informing decision making with proper and quality data and statistics. Now, in these conditions, you need to be ready. You need to be flexible. And you will see how uh, uh, during the planning process, you should take into consideration this. When it happens, you have to react to it. You have to revise your, your NSDS if you do have it. If you don't have it, you have to, to be also uh, flexible to take into consideration the current needs, the current means, and uh, try to imagine it, all scenarios that can exist can help you to address these issues. Of course, there is also uh, in these uh, uh, conditions, there is also problem in terms of funding. Sometimes the funding is there, but because of the crisis, because, because of the fragility situation, it's not coordinated. And it is provided all over the place and it might not meet the, 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 the requirement for uh, the planning data that we, we, we need to, to produce. So there is also a need to see how the funding can be, the funding process can be uh, coordinated at this uh, time. Now, during the process of the NSDS, uh, what do we do? It's clear that during this uh, crisis and, uh, and the fragility situations, we have to be uh, pragmatic. We have to be pragmatic. We have to assess very quickly the needs, the current needs uh, of the NSS. And we have to take into consideration all the risks uh, brought about the crisis and the fragility and take them on board. And you will see that uh, this is, uh, of course, during the assessment uh, uh, phase. But uh, I, I want to mention here that we are actually revising the NSDS, probably if we do have it because of the, this crisis, to make it relevant. And once we have identified uh, the, 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 the 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 indicators or let's say the the, the, the needs. Uh, we have then to adjust our priority strategic goals and the outputs for the NSS, which are adapted to the crisis and the fragility. 
and then of course associated actions uh, and their costs and how this can respond to the immediate recovery indicators, uh, I mean, uh, indicators associated to the recovery uh, pro uh, policies and programs, but also trying to look ahead uh, of how you can reconstruct your system. Because when you have the, the, the crisis, when you have the fragility, yes, you have the recovery pro uh, uh, process, but you should look ahead also on how you reconstruct the system. Of course, the monitoring and evaluation uh, during the implementation of this type of uh, NSDS in crisis is key to make sure that you are uh, on track and how you can adjust quickly uh, to address the identified uh, uh, indicators. Well, uh, we have gone through this, uh, all of us. Uh, I'm talking about especially the, the, the NSS, the NSOs uh, during the COVID-19. And uh, we have discussions, uh, maybe having experiences from uh, all the countries that are present here. The, the, the lesson learned from the crisis, some of them, there are many, but one is that the crisis creates also a very high data demand. And not only high data demand, but timely and very targeted. There is very high competition from data ecosystem providers that produce data that the NSS, the NSO can't produce and are conflicting with the existing data. This creates a problem of coordinating the NSS, the data ecosystem itself, and aligning the NSDS to the short-term priorities versus medium to long-term uh, priorities. There is a problem on communicating and disseminating the information. During the crisis, the policymakers, they need data now, not tomorrow. And we, are, we face the problem of how do we communicate the data? How do we disseminate the data? But how do we uh, get ready the technology to do it as well? Produce the data, but also communicate the data as fast as possible. There is also a problem of funding. Yes, the national uh, budget will decrease for statistics because the attention is on the crisis. But also even the available uh, funding from government partners, uh, when they are there, they are also not focusing on statistics, but focusing on the sectors that are affected by the crisis. So these are some of the challenges and the lessons uh, learned from the crisis situation. And maybe we can discuss on how we overcome this. So uh, let me stop my presentation here, Mary. Uh, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Philip, for that quite informative presentation that is actually aligned to what is happening in our national statistical offices now, particularly given the COVID-19 situation. And uh, I welcome reactions from participants so that uh, we can have an in-depth discussion as to how best we can uh, manage these challenges and what it is that we can be able to do moving forward to be able to cope as Philip has informed us. So please reactions. Are we still there? We are quite quiet now. <laughs> yes, can, can I say something? <laughs> okay, Selena, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks to the, the great presentation by Filippi on this 
uh, unusual. It's it's not a a, a common uh, um, uh, what a common thing to to talk about uh, fragility and crisis in statistics. So thank you very much for this. Um, I I I don't know. I was thinking Philip Philip is. Uh, a presentation was also going to talk about how how this can be uh, addressed, but um, I think uh, from the experience of the COVID nineteen, especially here in Lesotho, I, I remember at the time that the, the lockdown was announced, uh, everyone was calling the the statistics, me and my colleagues, to to see how data can be generated. So we were so much uh, overwhelmed with the, the, the demand, uh, especially in the area of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we learned lessons. Uh, I think this, these are some issues, some things that have been uh, discussed in most of our meetings, regionally, globally, all of that, that we, 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 we have to uh, modernize our statistics uh, 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 approaches of collecting data across the entire NS NSS and make sure that we have uh, uh, better systems uh, in place and uh, maybe also databases that speak to each other across the NSS so that during such time we would just go to a center of data or the data hub and maybe sit down as um, experts of different areas depending on the crisis and then come up with models and to whatever uh, uh, data we can generate depending on the needs of, of a country at the time. So I think that this is what uh, what the, the whole statistics family globally has been talking about that we should always be prepared. And I also think data science is one of the, the approaches that could help us overcome uh, this challenge. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Selina, for your reaction, Yandiswa. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the presenter. Uh, in line with what Lesotho is saying, um, we may need to think as this statistics family on how we respond uh, to, to such crises as what Lesotho was referred to. Uh, in the case of South Africa, for example, during the crisis, we had to do some rapid, uh, rapid response surveys. Uh, we did not have the PPE as part of uh, our basket for the CPI, so we had to run a parallel survey uh, to get information on, on how much PPE was being bought where. So we did some surveys that I think as this community would frown upon. Uh, we still kept our regular surveys, but we had additional surveys to respond to the crisis, uh, which were well appreciated by um, uh, by the public, um, but not so much by internal people from Status A because we're a bit uncomfortable in getting into this kind of space. My point is therefore, Chair and Philip, uh, it, it's the agility uh, that NSOs have to respond to crises. Uh, what do we do? We modernize have additional surveys, have surveys where we know that this is not official statistics, uh, use alternative data, the quality of that data. So there's a lot that we need to think about. And we had to move from face-to-face -face data collection to telephonic interviews. And that was a major shift because we we're not prepared for it in some of the instances. We would know where the, the how the, the, we have our listings about your, special information framework. Uh, we have all of these things, but we didn't have numbers for all of the households. And that became a, a very big problem. So my, my point is, yeah, what do we do with all of this? Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Jen. Thank you, Yandiswa. 
Philip, do you want to come up again and uh, give maybe some your like practical experience on uh, what is the possible solutions that maybe can be done, like the way Yandi is asking that uh, what is it that uh, we are able to do? And uh, given the environment whereby, as you said during your presentation, that you get that even now priority shifts and even funding towards statistics is more or less slashed. So if you have any experience, maybe you could uh, share with us what is practical. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mary. And uh, thank you, Selina and, and, and Yandisa. Th th these are very, very good comments. And as I highlighted when uh, I started my presentation, this is a kind of uh, provocative presentation. I, I, I'm not intending to give you solutions, but highlight what actually we are <laughs> going through during crisis. However, they are solutions. Sometimes crises, they create problems, but also they are also source of uh, maybe improving some of uh, uh, the methods that we are currently using. Uh, and I like uh, the example from uh, Lesotho and, uh, and South Africa and in other many countries, actually they, ad they, they, they adapted themselves, their systems to uh, innovating the way of collecting data using uh, telephone-based surveys and web-based surveys. And this created a kind of uh, having data very faster uh, in terms of collection, but also in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, dissemination. Now, there is a conflicting issue here, getting the data very fast and ensure that the quality of data is there. Now, that's where you have to, uh, to, 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 to decide. Of course, you need data and you need to highlight the limit of the data you are producing and the data will still be used with the limited uh, quality that you highlight. So there is a need to be very transparent here uh, and inform the users. But the basic uh, thing here is to modernize, innovate the national statistical systems. Yandisa, uh, yes, the, the surveys, the quick surveys, adapting to very uh, fast and quick surveys is one solution. But I do think that we might uh, probably think about uh, how do we strengthen our admin statistics, administrative data sources. Because where you have the administrative data sources well established, you might produce your data very fast and at a very decentralized level. Let's say the CRVS, for example. If you have the CRVS systems well established, as a, I, I think that that will help us to create or to produce data on, 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 the, on, on the population and how probably the population are, are affected by any, any of uh, the, the, this crisis. Uh, I have seen, for example, in, de in developed countries, how they were calculating the mortality rate using the actual data coming from uh, hospitals and centers and using the trends that they were uh, collecting before from their usual uh, CRVS systems. And it happened to, to, to be very, very informative. But now in, most of the African countries, for example, the CRVS is not there. So how can we build the administrative data very uh, 
modernize it and digitalize it, but also parallelly uh, be ready to conduct very short and timely surveys targeted to inform a very specific situation. So I would re rather look at, look at it as yes, short term solutions, but also trying to build a long term solution for the national statistical systems. Let me stop here, uh, Mary. Uh, I will be happy to come in again uh, if, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Actually, that is practical, whereby you adapt to the situation as it is. Usually, we say that is baptism by fire, but uh, actually, most NSOs had to adapt and remain relevant because the government wants statistics and uh, they are not supporting you in the first instance, but they need actually information. And you know, you have to remain relevant. So I would support uh, what uh, suggestions that are being put forward, that we have to modernize, we have to innovate, we have to think medium term, short term, but also long term for comparison and all that. In the chat, Teddy is asking, okay, thank you, Philip, for your presentation. When data production is not taken into consideration as a national priority in terms of crisis, and it must be supported, the government will find itself unable to provide solutions and determine how to intervene to reduce the crisis. It will be complicated by that, and another crisis will be created as a result of absence of statistics. Yes, and it is part of what uh, Philip told us during his presentation, when he was saying that uh, in terms of crisis, definitely the government will still need you to give the statistics, but priority will have gone to manage the crisis. So it is a crisis in a crisis. I don't really know how to put it forward, but it, it may look like a crisis in a crisis, but that is why really it is important for us to get these resources to know that such things do exist and to be able to know that when it happens to us, how should we be able to manage and stay afloat? So while we are still thinking, I think we have some few minutes and I can see we have some more hands up. So kindly, Joseph, Kamara, take the floor. Yes, uh, here in Liberia, we experience crisis that caught us unaware. Could you, could you kindly try to manage the background noise? I don't know whether it put us, maybe there's some noise in the background. You can try maybe to unmute a bit, whatever is in the background, because we are hearing an echo. Joseph, kindly proceed. Joseph, have we lost you? Can you hear me now, please? Okay, okay. As I was saying, here in Liberia, the crisis that we experience. Just a minute, let me say that. Am I? Yeah. Yes, that is better. Joseph, kindly proceed. Okay. As, uh, sorry, Joseph, you still have quite some disturbance in the background. Maybe as you try to sort it out. Okay, I think it is sorted out now. As I was saying, crisis 
uh, most of the time, people are not expecting crisis. Some crises come unexpectedly, and this can create a gap in the statistical system. Like for example, uh, some years ago when the Ebola came to Liberia, it was not something that we expected. Uh, so um, government set up a system called a disaster management agency. Yet that crisis helped us to be able to improve our statistical system. So we had the GRS and the data processing here in Lisgis, which is responsible for official statistics. And they started to work together to create a system where they can be able to get quick impact data that can help the government to make decisions. So what helped us here in Liberia is the Statistic House working along with the Disaster Management Agency that was set up by government so that they can be prepared for further crisis that may come unexpected. And this has really helped us because even this coronavirus now, Legis is working along with the other agency to be able to handle it. So one of the, the step forward, I think, is for the institution or the government to set up an institution that will work along with the statistic hub, where they can be able to use the GPS that we are using now to be able to collect quick impact data. It's true that we may need a long term uh, coordination or way of collecting data that can help to make the decision, but it's good we set up an agency that can able to work along with the statistic house in order to be able to have a quick response to this disaster or crisis when they come. So that was one of the things I was really looking at it. All agency could do it, that could help. Thank you, Joseph, for that uh, suggestion. Josephine from Zambia. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good everyone. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, the presenters, for the very insight um, presentation that they've made. The lady from Lesotho, Philip, and uh, the other lady I've forgotten is the trawler. Yeah. Um, looking at the, I think, uh, Philip's presentation, I was looking at, uh, I think it now calls for countries to improve their vital registration system because we have, like he, the other presenter had indicated, we as a government, we need data. We cannot stop requiring data for policy making for decision making. So the NSOs have to remain relevant to the process. And in such, uh, in so doing, they need to actually find ways of providing this uh, information. And uh, because of that, um, suggesting or proposing to Paris 21 and start Africa to actually maybe given a bit of uh, assistance to a lot of NSOs to improve their vital registration system. Because I think if we have a, a very good vital registration system in place within our countries, I think it will, it will help us uh, use information that we may require. I know we may not have the, uh, like the all indicators that we, we require, like Lesotho had presented, there are like 152 indicators that they're following, but what is available is 101. So again, but they, there's that gap, but in a way they're able to use whatever is available to help them with their policy uh, making and decision making. So I think uh, that was my appeal to Paris 21 and start Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. I believe Philippe and the team from Paris 21 and South Africa have heard of that appeal. 
And uh, also there's a request from participants that uh, the presentations from day one be shared. So I hope also Paris 21 will look into that to share the very vital resources that have been presented here with countries. I would request to wrap up now for the, in, in the interest of time, because I can't even see any other reactions and request uh, Libya to take us through their experience on fragility and statistical planning. Libya, who is presenting from Libya? Do we have a participant from Libya presenting? Chair, chair, chairperson, uh, sorry, maybe we, we, we can ask uh, Madam Muna if, uh, if he has any update on this. Uh, as on my side, I can't yes. identify who is presenting from Libya currently. Mm -hmm. Muna, can okay. you hear me? Yes, I hear you, uh, Philippe. I uh, normally the DG of the NSO of Libya will present the experience of Libya, but uh, he confirmed with me yesterday. And today I cannot join it with email. So I am afraid they have a, a problem with connection, electricity or, uh, or internet connection. Okay, that is quite unfortunate. It's also part of the crisis. <laughs> the crisis of because internet and electricity. <laughs> But yes, yes. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. if, if I may suggest, th this was a presentation from Libya to share the experience uh, during the, the, the COVID-19, but all countries actually have gone through it and it was an opportunity for all countries to share their experiences and, uh, and, and uh, uh, lessons learned from the crisis. Uh, maybe if you don't mind, you can take us through uh, discussions uh, where all countries present here can, uh, can share the, the, the experience. Yeah, thank you, Philip. I agree with you because um, uh, yes, Libya was to share on the COVID-19 experience and as has already been said by Lesotho, by South Africa, we all experienced this COVID-19 pandemic and how did we cope? So which countries are willing to share the experience? I am aware that uh, quite a number of countries did something, Kenya, Uganda, Sierra Leone. Kindly, please share with us your experience for the benefit of other countries. Who's going first? Hello, Madam Chairperson. This is Sheila. Yes, Sheila, Zambia. Kindly share with us your experience. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I hope I don't get cut off. I'll speak quickly. Um, the issue of Philip's presentation. On the light and what I want to say that perhaps some crises are important for statistical activities. This is an area where we really struggle to get funds easily. Now, through the COVID um, crisis, there was a lot of demand for data in all angles, from all angles, uh, sectors, and even support from um, cooperating partners. There was so much willingness to share support for data on this crisis, some of which uh, support we've been seeking and yearning for for most of our routine activities. So that's on the light side that it has a positive effect in terms of getting some data. So it required obviously some smartness and uh, we were able, I think uh, we got some very good response because the donor community got together, especially the UN system and the World Bank, they agreed to support this survey and through an integrated process, survey process, 
So it became phase one of this integrated service. And through that interaction, concerted um, efforts, we will be also able to get support for some other survey that we've not done for many years. Um, so I see a benefit to that, but obviously it puts the statistical office on a spin. You really have to react quickly. And I wanted to comment, I think from Nyandi's presentation that a contribution that obviously at all times, we cannot run away from having quality statistics. I think giving out statistics, which may be questionable, there's no coming back you know, from the NSO. To, to recover from that can be very challenging. So it may be still important that we churn out statistics which are of quality, even if we lose some time. I think for, for, for me, that would be my take on that matter. So we probably just have to see how best we can get ready for some of these crises in terms of capacities. I thank you. I just thought I should share. So Zambia has conducted, um, and the results will be shared very soon, a social economic impact assessment of COVID on households where we visited over 10,000 households. And um, it's got very interesting results and we are very happy to assist with this. It brings out relevance of the NSO to the overall national statistical system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila, for sharing Zambia's experience. Ghana, Gambia, the Gambia. The Gambia was not initially much affected by COVID. Would you be willing to share with us your experience, the Gambia and Ghana, if possible? Okay. Hello, this is Gloria from Ghana. Yes, Gloria, go ahead. Yes, um, you know, COVID-19 gave um, Statistics Office and we here in Ghana, it gave us the opportunity to explore using new ways in collecting data and all that. Um, during the process, we came out with a few reports we had the opportunity to do a business and a business tracker and a household and job tracker, which um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, starting from when we had a partial lockdown throughout to when there was ease, um, gradual ease of lockdown. And we were able to do these three um, surveys via using the mobile phone like it was a phone survey and the results were very um, exciting to share. Maybe we'll, we'll share with, with you later. It's on our website. And we, at that point to under the SDG activities, we were doing a citizen generated data survey, but we had to put a whole, we had to hold on to it because of movement. So we resorted to using virtual means to communicate for the citizen generated data there were two pilot projects one on gender-based violence and the other on waste and at, 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 at a point where we needed people to come on board to help us select we used the uh, mobile app approach so during that phase we had to use the virtual means for to select developers who were going to develop the app so we brought together various developers and we were able to select one to build the apps, two, two companies to build the apps for us to do the waste um, project and the gender-based violence project. All these were done virtually, which was something new and we we're able to go through it. Um, we'll share the reports with you later on. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for that done experience, and we look forward to getting the reports. Molly, Molly, Nina, you have a minute. We are a bit now running out of time, but Molly and then Emmanuel. And uh, one minute, maybe. One Thank minute you here. very much. Thank you very much. This is Molly Nina from Uganda. 
during the COVID lockdown, we realized that the need for the statistics was overgrowing, overwhelming. So we need to think of conducting surveys. And we realized that the economy was being hit, economy faring. So we had to conduct a rapid survey on the effects of the COVID. We used mainly phone interviews and were able to find this survey and if it's which guy especially. The other thing we did, my network is not good. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay, let me just type on the chat. Let me type on the chat. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Molly, for that. The internet is not that uh, clear. Who did we have? Emmanuel, you put your hand down. Sarah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, let, let me just add. You see, like uh, I think Felipe mentioned, uh, the issue of crisis, and for that matter, COVID-19 uh, in specific. At the time, there was a capacity issue. Uh, Gloria mentioned that we used the telephone interview approach. We, we didn't have the capacity then. We had never conducted any survey using telephone interview. And that really was the point where we had to quickly innovate and then uh, get that capacity built through assistance of an agency that we have in the country. So we had an MOU and they helped us in that direction. And I can see now that we have the capacity in the area of using telephone interview. So it was a kind of a, a, a blessing in disguise, you know, the crisis. And also the use of uh, call records to trace uh, movement of people uh, and then how people identify with COVID were interacting with various people and their movement. These were all new areas that we had never explored until the COVID came up and exposed all of us and we had to quickly sit up. So this is one thing that as NSOs, we need to uh, be up and doing on. And there's one fundamental thing, uh, what do you call it? We need to have a policy that will also help us to work in times of crisis. Because at the time of lockdown, the government asked some vital agencies to work. But then you need to prove that your policy allows you to do such things. So if in the absence of those uh, strategic policies that allows you to work under crisis, it, it becomes very difficult to just say it's crisis, so you work in. So this is a few that I want to add. Thank you, Anova. Thank you, Emmanuel. And uh, Nina, I've seen uh, you've typed something in the chat, but uh, maybe you can take the floor again after Sarah. We try to see whether your internet is now better. So Sarah, go first. And then uh, once you are through, Nina can take the floor again. Uh, thank you, Mary, for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to say something about uh, how Kenya coped, and uh, we are still coping. Um, we, the first, uh, as been mentioned by many other countries, uh, was about the socioeconomic impact uh, of COVID on households in Kenya. Uh, we also used the computer-assisted telephone interviews to conduct the survey, and uh, we from that, we have had many improvements. And now that we are developing our sample, sampling frame, uh, we are going to look for the, like the telephone uh, information from the respondents so that we can use it in future if you are going to use this technique for data collection. So I think uh, those are the lessons we are learning from uh, the crisis and for improvements in future data collection exercises. Uh, then we, from the crisis, we had some budget cuts from the government, and uh, we had to look into collaborations and uh, support from development partners 
and other members of the NSS so that we could keep the activities of the NSS running. So we are, are also looking at how to explore and um, optimize the resources that are available in the NSS. Uh, we also looked at the administrative sources of data and um, how they can help during crisis and how we can better coordinate the national statistical system and have all this data available for analysis in different situations. Um, the alternative sources of data, we are also looking into that, the citizen generated data and uh, the big data and um, also looking at other technological advancements that can help us obtain data even in crisis such that if we cannot go out, out to the households to collect the data or the establishments, we can still uh, get data to, to report and for planning purposes. So as we're also going to do our review of the Kenya strategy for development of statistics, we are going to put all this into considerations and uh, improve, uh, improve the statistics we produce. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for sharing the Kenyan experience. Nina, if you are there, please try to give it a go again. Molly, Uganda. Yes, thank you. I hope I'm audible now. You are much better. Hello. Okay, as I was saying earlier on as Uganda, we also had to look outside the usual normals to see that things keep on going because the demand of statistics was also overwhelming. So we managed to conduct a business impact assessment coming out from the effect of the pandemic onto the businesses and the economy. The results were able to disseminate and were used to make certain decisions which we which we are seeing that it is rejuvenating the businesses, for example, the government had to come on with a fund to support the businesses so that they could gain back from the losses they made, especially during the time of the total lockdown. And some of those decisions were informed by the survey. We did a rapid survey on the impact of the COVID-19 using telephone interviews. We also managed to conduct an impact survey on a gender-based violence as a result of the pandemic, but unfortunately this one, we did not finalize it. And the results are yet to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, for that presentation of how Uganda was able to go about it. Any other country, we don't want to knock our country out. Any other country experience? The Gambia, are you with us? Any other person willing to give their thoughts on the issue under discussion? Okay, I will uh, give you one challenge. Most of us, we are saying that uh, we were able to do telephone interviews and we try to adapt, but I know in most of our countries, we did not have a frame to, or the proper infrastructure, even to be able to get a, a master frame of the, of the people, the respondents that uh, we can actually target using the telephone interviews. So how are we planning to handle that? Sarah hinted a bit that uh, they are trying moving forward to come up with a frame, but uh, in our own countries, are we also thinking of the same? Because we are saying, yes, we adopt technology, but you end up getting that uh, the technology, we are at different levels of technology. So it will really be interesting to know how it is and what the countries are doing to really overcome that. Diba, Diba, kindly, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. Um, my apologies. Uh, I am running a couple of other activities, so I'm, I'm not um, fully uh, with you guys. But then, 
I just want to share um, our experience um, with regards to the telephone interviews. Um, uh, basically, we used um, a former survey data as a frame. Um, the reason is because um, most of the interviews or surveys that we conduct, we don't um, collect certain variables that were needed for this survey. And uh, because the, for instance, the level four survey was the one that was more comprehensive regarding the telephone numbers and um, the variables of interest for the survey that we wanted to conduct. So um, other countries started before us and we learned from the experience because when they started the first wave of the telephone interview, it was a panel, panel interviews. Um, subsequent waves, they struggled to maintain their sample size because of um, higher rates of attrition. So what we did was after the, after the sampling, we selected the number of households, uh, um, sorry, we identified the number of households that we need for the survey. Um, we oversampled and conducted what is called the awareness campaign. First, we, we conducted, um, a search questionnaire and called all the numbers that were um, in the in the sample. So we suffered from two things. One, some of the numbers were not working because for the telecom companies, if you have not used your number for a um, couple of months, they will disable it and, and reallocate it. So we suffered from that, and we that was a reason why we conducted that. We also wanted to know those who are going to be willing to continue the survey um, month, on, um, month after month. So that enabled us to be able to get the sample size that we need to conduct the, the, the panel data. But then, <clears throat> I am sorry, the, 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 the panel data survey. However, we also tried to in, um, create an, an, an incentive just to tell them a thank you whenever they conduct, um, they participate in the survey. So by that, we, what we do was, um, what we do is anytime we interview you, we'll send you an amount of um, airtime just to tell you thank you for participating in our survey. So <clears throat> it's not it's not very uh, different from what we what other countries did. The only thing that where well, that was different was we first conducted an awareness campaign to be able to maintain our our sample, sample size. So and we are in the seventh round now, and we are able to maintain um, at least um, ninety three percent uh, um, wave after wave in the in the sample size. So <clears throat> I think this is an approach that. Um, we can we can we can, we can do because the other surveys don't adequately collect the telephone numbers of of the household heads. Thank you. Thank you, Diba, for sharing that experience. It is quite interesting. Thank you. Anybody else willing to take the floor? We still have some time. Anyone else? Okay. If uh, we've exhausted that, then uh, I would want to thank you all for being active in the sessions that we've had today. And I would request to return the chair back to Philip to give us a way forward on the next session that we are going to undertake. Philip, kindly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary, uh, for your, your, your great facilitation moderation. And uh, thank you all for your participation and your contributions. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, a very interesting topic uh, indeed, uh, being the uh, the situation where we are, all of us, and trying to uh, be more relevant uh, and fit for purpose, we need to adapt ourselves, uh, adapt our uh, statistical systems uh, to uh, to the demand and to the technology, especially modernizing uh, the statistical systems uh, to 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 try to be relevant and. Uh, I think we have to be proactive. 
that's the most uh, important thing uh, that we nobody we come towards us to transform the systems we have to be proactive and uh, start that journey to the transformation and uh, uh, try to interest the or to get the interest and the buy-in and the support from policymakers and all development partners because I don't see uh, who does not need statistics indeed to, to plan and, 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 and evaluate the, the development, the, the policies and so on. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we were supposed to have a evaluation, but the evaluation of the, 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 the training will not be done uh, uh, straight away online. We will send a, a short questionnaire of the evaluation uh, and uh, we really uh, ask you to fill out the, question, the questionnaire uh, that will help all of us to, uh, to, to, to improve the way uh, of organizing the, 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 our virtual uh, training, but also uh, the content, and we would like you to uh, mention the, the areas that you think are most important now, so that we, we, we can, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with you and uh, the organizers of the training, we can incorporate uh, those uh, areas in the next, uh, the next trainings. Uh, that we help will help us a lot. So uh, I'm I'm not uh, quite sure if uh, Samson is uh, is uh, it's on the call already. Uh, yes. Otherwise, we can move towards the the closing session, and uh, I want also to uh, thank you very much and. Uh, uh, reiterate my request yesterday, if you can please share with us your uh, latest NSDS or any statistical plan you might have. Uh, it's an information that not only help us to, to know the status of uh, every country in terms of designing and implementing a statistical plan, uh, but also uh, it gives information uh, on how you are going about implementing your, 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 your NSDS and how we can continue advocate for uh, the financing for statistics through your statistical plan. So uh, it's a, a, a very good information uh, for us, but also for, for countries, uh, we are all on the battle of uh, trying to advocate for better funding for, for data and, and statistics. So this is an information that will help us. And uh, uh, it also help other countries to compare themselves uh, and learn from the, the NSDS that are developed in other countries, because we, we update the NSDS status report every year, and you can find it uh, on Paris 21 website. Uh, so if we have the documents themselves, uh, the countries going under developing their NSDS can also have access to those documents and learn from uh, each other. So it's a, a kind of peer learning uh, approach that uh, we, we, we can put in place and allow other countries to benefit from what others are doing. So thank you very much. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, discussing with, with all of you and getting your, your views, your contributions. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that it will help us to improve uh, much more our, our support to partner countries. Uh, Samson, uh, I hand over to you the, the, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 
uh, Philip, and uh, thank you very much. Now we are coming to the closing uh, remark of of, uh, of of our training. So I think, uh, as uh, Philip mentioned, it was a very four-day strong discussion among uh, ourselves, and then uh, it was very good, and uh, we learned a lot, especially from a new generation of NSDS as well as ADAPT tools. I think it was very, very good and very interesting discussion. So I think now we come to the closing section of uh, this uh, of this training. And uh, before that, I would like to inform you that uh, next week, we are going to have also the same training session for French speaking country. So we will, uh, this week it's for the English speaking country. So next week, start a free together with Paris 21. UN, UNICA and then African Development Bank will organize the session for English speaking country, sorry, for French speaking country, sorry. So I think having said that, we are supposed to have uh, Madame Leila now for the closing remark, but due to some situation over her control, will not be, I will read her speech. So allow me now to read, read the speech of Madame Leila. So dear representative from Paris 21, Dear representative from African Development Bank, dear representative from the United Nations Economic Community, Economic Community for Africa, dear coordinator of Shasta 2, or national coordinator or regional coordinator of NSDS or RSDS, dear participant, by thanking the speaker for the excellent quality of the presentation, which I was able to follow up myself. I would like at the same time to congratulate you on your diligence of, on, and the seriousness with which you participate in this regional training workshop. I have I, I noticed that on the average, there were 60 participants, 60 participants per session. This denotes the interest that you, you attach to the various topics treated during this week. Your presentation, and then your intervention, as well as the quality of the discussion has sufficient proof it. As I announced at the launching of this training, Start Africa, the African Union Institute for Statistics based in Tunis, is delayed with a partnership approach with the Pan-African Organization on one hand and with the Party 21 in, in another. Start Africa will continue to involve all African Union member states and the regional economic community in building our knowledge heritage, which is a precious investment to pass to the future generation. I would like also to remind you that for us, and believe me, I, I said this without prejudice to other special technical group, the SDG 18 on NSDS is a strategic SDG because it deal with the essence of organization of a statistical work at a continental, regional, and national level. This workshop is the first step in the implementation of a new generation of NSDS 3.0, integrating Shasta 2. It will follow by other seminar and workshop dealing in more depth with the topic discussed here. Finally, I invite you to start building on the, to start building capacity on the basic of the lesson learned in your respect, respective country and community. I thank you. So that is the speech I read on behalf of Madame Leila, the head of statistics division, South Africa, Africa Union Commission. So according to the agenda, we are now going to have the, the second speech from Mr. Francois the deputy head of uh, Paris 21. But it look like also Mr. Francois also have some emergency issue. So he couldn't reach us for the, for the closing remark. He sent his apologies for all the participants. So allow me now to give a floor to Mr. Philip, who will represent Mr. Francois as the closing remark. So Mr. Philip, please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. and. Uh... Uh, apologies from uh, Francois Fontenot, uh, the Deputy Director of 
uh, Paris 21. Uh, he has uh, an emergency situation that uh, uh, he couldn't join the closing uh, uh, this, uh, this training. Uh, and uh, he asked me to thank you, all of you, uh, starting from uh, all the countries that are present here uh, through the NSO, NSS, and uh, uh, planning commissions that uh, are represented in this uh, in this training uh, so uh, thank you all of you uh, as well as the representative from the regional economic communities that uh, attended uh, this this training uh, you may recall that uh, this is really a high uh, participatory training and we had uh, we, we currently have 23 countries participating. This is a good uh, record. And we also have four uh, rates that are participating here, which is uh, an indication of uh, the Rio needs to strengthen the statistic system in the African continent. And uh, we are delighted actually to continue <clears throat> our partnership with uh, uh, Start Africa, uh, UNECA, uh, African Development Bank, all partner countries and the RECs to strengthen the data and statistics through the national statistical systems and uh, under the coordination of the national statistical offices, uh, we, we continue to uh, advocate for better financing for statistics to uh, strengthen the capacity of uh, the statistics offices and the statistical systems uh, in the continent. So this has been really a very good training where uh, you realize that the national strategy for the development of statistics, it, uh, it as the central of uh, NSS uh, development, or let me put it as uh, development data and statistics. Without uh, the NSDS, we might be uh, challenged on the coordination of uh, the national statistical systems and at large, the data ecosystems. So uh, we thank you very much once again, and uh, we will continue to, to support as, uh, as we can. And uh, we are open to discuss further bilaterally uh, through the activities that are covered uh, by Paris 21, of course, in collaboration with uh, all the all, all our our partners, and uh, especially the organizers of this training. So uh, thank you once again. Thank you very much uh, for your participation, your contribution, and uh, we will keep in touch to continue developing data and statistics in the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for this very good speech on behalf of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Francois Fontenot, who is the deputy head of, uh, of uh, Paris 21. So I don't know, Francois, uh, Philip, do you have uh, any announcement uh, before we close? Uh, any announcement? Because many participants are asking about the presentation and then also the recording of the meeting. So I don't know if there is any announcement on that. Yes, uh, we will share all the, the presentations uh, with, uh, with all the participants and they will be accessible also through uh, Paris 21 website. And uh, also after uh, editing some of uh, the recording uh, of the meeting, uh, I mean to, 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 to have a more sizable uh, file we will also share it with the participants who will request it. Uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, 
if you don't hear from us, please uh, just shoot out a, a, a message and we will we, we respond. Uh, again, I want to say that we will send uh, out an evaluation questionnaire that will be very light. Uh, please do fill out the questionnaire so that uh, it can help us to improve our, our mode of support and organization of such a, a training. And as Samson said, uh, this is a training that will be uh, replicated in French in next week, already from Monday. Uh, we are receiving uh, already good rate of participation as you did uh, for the, the, the English speaking countries in the continent. So looking forward to more uh, detailed uh, training sessions. And uh, on behalf of Paris 21, I, I would uh, like to say that we are open to uh, more uh, detailed training in, uh, in ADAPT if you would like to, uh, to request for it. And also uh, gender statistics as well as, uh, as, as the cap capacity development 4.0. Of course, we continue together supporting the NSDS. Yeah, so thank you very much, Samson. I think uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much, Philip. I think now we come to the end of uh, our training uh, session. Thank you very much for those, for all of us. It was very, very, very good training for the last 40. So I think maybe we can now open our camera to say goodbye to each other. Until uh, we meet again, and the situation will allow us to meet again uh, face to face. So I think it's always good to open our camera and say goodbye to each other. So please, Colleen, can you can you open your camera? Bye -bye. Say, yeah, yeah, I think it's still low. Please, can you open your camera, Colleen? If your situation, if your internet allow you, please open your camera. You can see our face. And then we hope the situation will allow us soon. And then maybe before the co DG meeting, we'll organize another training again. So thank you very much, Colin. And uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are, uh, or maybe good morning for those who are in another part of the world. So, okay, thank you very much, Colin. And then have a good afternoon, good evening, and uh, see you soon. Hope that uh, the COVID will allow us soon to meet face to face. We can see Nandi or Isaac face to face and see to see each other <laughs> behind the camera. Okay, thank you very much, colleague. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.